Welcome back to Urgent Word. Here we are continuing in this letter that Paul wrote to churches in the region of Galatia. It's an urgent one. There's the presence of false teachers. So here Paul slips into an autobiography. So who is our author? What is his story of faith? Not long ago, we did a series called Living Faith in which part of our faith family, they came and told the story of how they came to follow Jesus. Well, you might be really familiar with Paul's story. His conversion is famous. In Acts chapter 9, Luke, the journalist here who is writing this second letter uh, to his friend Theophilus, records Paul's conversion story. And in it, Paul dramatically encounters the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his whole life is changed. You see, he was an enemy. He persecuted Christians. He wanted to put down this movement. He was kind of a Judaizer, the crowd he's actually teaching against to the max. He didn't even believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He thought this was a completely false thing that needed to be put down and put down violently. And he encountered Jesus and his whole life changed. And then we hear again as Luke picks up this this story of the early church of the Holy Spirit expanding uh, the, the good news all the way from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. We have a record of, of Paul's missions that really occupy the, the rest of the book of Acts. Like he's all over the map. He's traveling everywhere. These are the familiar parts of Paul's story. But today we actually get a glimpse of some of the in-between. Paul gives us a bit of his autobiography. What happened between his conversion and the amazing amount of missions he did, church planning, letter writing, being used by God to spread the good news throughout the world. What happened in between? Paul actually leverages his story of coming to faith in this argument that the Galatian church is affected by these false teachers. And apparently, if we're reading between the lines, if we're doing our text espionage well, Paul seems to be giving a defense of his apostleship, of the legitimacy of his story, of how he's been commissioned by Christ himself, probably because his credentials or his apostleship has been questioned. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to Revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. 
all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So that's Paul's autobiography of what has happened in between his conversion and this mission activity that we read about. Obviously, the church he's writing to is fruit of this mission that he's had. God has used Paul in powerful ways to testify about Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to people who are non-Jewish. The rest of the world has heard about Jesus in part because of Paul's faith, his message, and his life that he put on the line to spread the good news. Uh, let me just look at a map real quick. You guys like maps, right? I like maps. If you want to pause this, go for it. Just look at this little map here about the timeline and where Paul goes, even before he starts his missionary journeys. There's some points of interest here in Paul's autobiography, ones that we don't, I don't know, tarry over as much. At least I haven't heard as much ink spilled on these things, and I think it's worth pausing as we're trying to make ourselves aware of the debate in Galatia and what Paul is urgently writing to address as we have explored and unpacked and will continue to do so. I think it's really important to understand what Paul is digging up about his own faith history, about his own testimony. And there are two points of interest I want to tarry over. One, the desert pilgrimage. Why does Paul go to Arabia after he becomes a believer? What What's that about? And then this idea of silent years. And the scholars that have tried to reconstruct the timeline of Paul's events know that he went back to his hometown, Tarsus, for anywhere from five to ten years. So we have maybe a silent decade of Paul not being on the move all the time doing missions. So what's God doing with this person that we read about who has such confidence and clarity in, in his faith in Jesus Christ, speaking of him intimately? this personal commissioning, this personal relationship he has, it's very intimate with Jesus and is giving him the confidence to, to see clearly into the situations he's in in order to bolster the faith of the followers of Jesus in Galatia. How has God used this time? It's really interesting. Arabia is mentioned by Paul another time in the same letter Later in the book of Galatians, he's using an argument about Mount Sinai, and he mentions that Sinai is in Arabia. So scholars like N.T. Wright, for example, Hello, Tom! believe that what Paul did on this pilgrimage was in Arabia, this time spent in the desert, was to go to Mount Sinai. So why would Paul go to Sinai, as N.T. Wright speculates? Why would he take this trip to Arabia, as Paul reports to do? Mount Sinai was where God had come down in fire and had given Moses the Torah. It was the place of revelation, the place of law, the place where the covenant between God and Israel, established earlier with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was solemnly ratified. Sinai, the great mountain in Arabia, was, in that sense, the place of beginnings. It was the place to which subsequent generations looked back as the starting point of a long and checkered relationship. The often shaky marriage between this strange, rescuing, demanding God and his willful, stiff-necked people. Sinai was where Elijah had gone when it all went horribly wrong. Sinai was where Saul of Tarsus went for the same reason. Whether on foot or by donkey, one does not go for several days into a desert just to find a quiet spot to pray. Saul wanted to be clear that the shocking new thing that had been revealed to him really was the fulfillment, the surprising but ultimate satisfying goal of the ancient purposes of the one true God, purposes that had been set out particularly in the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. He wanted to stay loyal. Saul was coming to terms with the possibility that if the divine purposes had been completed in Jesus, it might mean that a whole new phase of the divine plan, hitherto barely suspected, had now been launched in a phase in which the Torah itself would be seen in a whole new light. And it's seeing the Torah, the Old Testament, in a whole new light that Paul devotes this letter to. We have to see properly how the Old Testament points to Christ. In a formational period in Paul's faith, he went to a place where his roots were. He went to the origin point of this covenant God's revelation 
And I think we can learn something deep about this. Paul did this physically in space, in time. He literally went there to where this thing happened. But we too can go deep into the Old Testament roots of our faith and see the same God revealed in Christ Jesus active from the very opening of the biblical narrative. That's the kind of confidence that we can have, that the the story that we call salvation history is indeed told by the very God we know intimately in Jesus Christ. And then as you saw on the map, there's this gap period where Paul, Saul, he's back in Tarsus, his hometown. What is he doing? Some people date this to five, six years. Some people date it as much as a decade. Let's read N.T. Wright again, just to help us understand the man who's writing this letter. Saul knew that the world needed redeeming. He also knew that it remained God's world. Saul then, I propose, spent the silent years in Tarsus laboring, studying, and praying, putting together in his mind a larger picture of the one God and his truth that would take on the world and outflank it. If Jesus was the fulfillment of the ancient scriptural stories, that conclusion was inevitable. But all the while, he must have been uncomfortably aware that this thoroughly Jewish vision of the one God and his world reshaped around the crucified and risen Messiah was, to put it mildly, not shared by all his fellow Jews. Saul must already have come up against the social, cultural, exegetical, and theological tension that would stay with him throughout his career. What sense could it make that Israel's Messiah would come to his own and that his own would not receive him? So think about this. Saul Paul spent years in preparation. He spent years in preparation. Years. Years. so easy to skip that Paul spent years in preparation between his conversion and his missions. Years. Years. But sometimes I think we expect this of ourselves, that this person who wrote this letter with such confidence and clarity, that there was no time of development. You just become a believer and you're totally mature as soon as you accept Jesus. And as soon as you're, you're, you're baptized into the body of the church, I'm, I've arrived. I need to be 100% confident. And I have everything I need. We can be confident. And we believe that God will give us what we need. But we need to realize that Paul himself, the guy who wrote this letter with such confidence and conviction, someone who God used to spread churches all around the world, spent years, years, studying, laboring, praying, and being transformed. Do you give yourself that kind of perspective that the strength of your christian witness your belief in christ that that perhaps you're in a development period have you thought about that so i'm not sure where you're at in your faith right now i'm not sure how confident you are i'm not sure if you're confused i'm not sure if you're wrestling something deep but i think we can learn from paul who arrived to this situation with a defense of Jesus bound up in his own deep personal story and experience with God. Have we given God the time and space to move in our lives to do the same for us? So I want to close with these reflection questions. When you are wrestling with your faith, where do you go? Paul went to the roots. He probably went to Mount Sinai. He went to the place where his faith started. If you had to take a pilgrimage to get closer to God, where would you go? Where are your roots? Where has God touched your life that you want to return to? How might God be preparing you now for serving him in the years to come? just as Paul was prepared for as much as a silent decade. God is active in your life today. Whether or not you feel you are growing and moving in your faith, whether or not you feel like you've done the kind of 
responsiveness to God, that you're, you're spreading the good news all over the place, remember this, that Paul spent about a decade in his hometown being developed by God before he spread the news around the world. Perhaps God is doing the same to you. Would you be patient alongside Paul and let God work on you now for what he plans to have you do in the future? I hope this has been helpful. We're going to dive in. As we've gotten to know Paul a little bit more, we're going to dive further into his confrontations, the nuances of his argument, and why this message is so important for us today. We'll see you next time on Urgent Word. Godspeed. Godspeed.